Hello, welcome to the Berkeley Center for New Media's Art, Technology and Culture Colloquium. My name is Alex Pasqual, and I'm an executive committee member at the Berkeley Center for New Media, which we also call the BCNM. The BCNM, and this is our new mission, so listen. The BCNM is an interdisciplinary research center that studies and shapes media transition and emergence from diverse perspectives. Through critical thinking and making, we cultivate technological equity and fairness in our classrooms, in our communities, and on the internet. Our Art, Technology, and Culture Colloquium, founded in 1997 by Ken Goldberg, is an internationally respected forum for creating creative ideas, free and open to the public, like yourselves. It represents leading artists, writers, and critical thinkers who question assumptions and push boundaries at the forefront of art, technology, and culture. We are very pleased to host Marisa Moran Jan with generous co sponsorship from the Ways and Phil Visiting Artist Lecture Series and the Jacobs Institute for Design and Innovation, in collaboration with, and this is a long list, Arts and Design Mondays, a regularly weekly series organized and sponsored by UC Berkeley's Arts and Design Initiative. The series is co curated by the Art Technology and Culture Colloquium at the BCNM, the Department of Art Practice, the Berkeley Art Museum and Pacific Film Archive, the Digital Humanities at Berkeley, the Arts Research Center, the Graduate School of Journalism, and the Richmond's Arts and Culture Commission. I would like to invite my fantastic colleague, Professor Shannon Jackson, to introduce Marisa. And thank you so much. Thank you, Alex. Hello, everyone. Um, thank you for being here. If a museum registrar was to take an inventory of Marisa Moran John's art practice, she might have difficulty deciding on its boundaries. Indeed, if you imagine a didactic, a museum didactic, chronicling her materials, what might it include? Paint and crayons, scarves and rags, and other other forms of fabric, vans and station wagons, photographs, phone apps, and videos, sometimes videos on bootlegged DVDs. The materials might also include paper and books and fabricated body parts and actual body parts. Lots of bodies, indeed, bodies of women who clean, the bodies of women who bear children, the bodies of women who care for the families of other women. Also clowns and politicians, different kind of clown, and children, sometimes her own son, sometimes the sons of other women, sometimes Honduran children harassed by a trickster clown who will do anything he can to get them to tell their stories. Indeed, Marissa Moran John wants lots of people to tell their stories. But like a lot of people concerned with the practice of equity, like a lot of people concerned with the future of actually existing democracy, they won't be the stories we usually hear, told by the people who are usually heard. It will be the stories of children and the stories of domestic workers and caregivers, the stories of experimental artists in Uganda, the stories of experimental artists in Queens, and experimenters all over the world who wouldn't necessarily call them art, themselves artists in the first place. To get these and others to tell their stories requires a setting, a degree of safety, a set of behaviors, a set of responsive interactions. The act of eliciting a story is a skill, um, especially when it's a story of someone who ha is as yet unheard. And Marisa John excels at that skill too. That skill is, after all, part of what make social practice social. It's arguably one of her materials as well, even if sociality is something hard to record on the registrar. The manipulation of objects, structures, systems, bodies, and stories is very much an evidence in so many of the conceptually rich and potently political projects that have been collaboratively conceived by Marisa Moranjan. Consider her feminist art projects on domestic labor, for instance, Care Force One Travelogue, when she and her station wagon met with nannies and housekeepers around the country to expose the imbricated inequities of labor, gender, immigration, and racial discrimination. Or Nanny Van, when she and her van set up pop-up booths and training sessions also around the country to educate and activate around those imbricated issues. 
John's other projects show her traveling across the country and the world, road tripping across the states, venturing to Uganda, or installing herself with Biblio Bandito in Honduras, that story-eating mythical beast who gets children to become storytellers. Her projects also show her tacking not only across the world, but across media, from crayons to pirated video, from offline conversation to online smart apps that humorously teach the labor rights of domestic workers. Her bio foregrounds most often that she's an MIT alum. It might be no surprise for some here to know that she's also a Berkeley alum. Indeed, she connects the dots between a character like Biblio Bandito and the characters she found here while a student at Berkeley, including, at one point, Pink Man, who she recalls flying on a unicycle in a pink unitard around campus. True to form. <laughs> and true to Berkeley form, John's projects are both refined and unwieldy, delicately extracting the philosophical underpinnings of an issue whose scale is so wide whose duration is so long, and whose systems are so puzzling that it requires not only the refinement of an artist, but the tolerance for cumbersomeness of an activist and an organizer. Hers is a mixed media practice that works with a decidedly mixed economy. Hers is a feminist practice that knows about the gendering of labor and the gendering of sociality. Indeed, she's one of a large and growing number of social practice artists who know that feminist art just might have been here first. And I'll say on the side with just a bit of inside baseball that she's also one of a much less large but hopefully growing number of feminist social practice artists who know that the settlement movement might have really been there first. John has now embarked on a new project that takes her interest in mixed economies and gendered bodies in a new direction. With Snatural History of Copper, we find her preoccupied with extraction and insertion, the un unexpected systemic connection between the extraction of copper and the manufacture of the intimate technologies of birth control. With her talk today, The Copper in My Cooch and Other Technologies, we will hear about this project, its connection to other projects, and its connection to other bodies, maybe some bodies in this room. And because I probably can't quote more from this project and still maintain my professional persona, um, and because it's her, not you, that you've arrived to hear, I'm gonna ask you to help me welcome a superhero artist who recognizes the superhero labor it takes to make this world run, Marisa Moran John. Thank you so much, and, and I am a proud Berkeley alum. I had a wonderful time here. Um, first, I want to thank the people who um, made this talk happen, and I also want to acknowledge my many collaborators who um, some may be in the room and um, who I learn from continuously, so thank you so much. Uh, I uh, founded an organization called Studio Rev, which um, now is about 10 years old, and we uh, co-design public art and creative media with low-wage, with and for low-wage workers, immigrants, um, youth and women. And throughout this talk, I'm inflecting it with a, um, this question of technology and really media for whom and by whom. So um, I'm interested in this question of who has access to technology. Um, as a short example, uh, Contratados is a project that we created with a migrant worker advocacy group and RADCAT, which is a Yelp site for migrant workers from Mexico where they rank and rate their employers. The project is entirely in Spanish and is um, specifically for the H1A and H the 20,000 H1A and H2B migrant workers from Mexico um, who work in the U.S. each year. So our Studio Rev's role was in creating the Know Your Rights comics and audio novellas. Um, and a, a guiding star for the work that I do is Arabian Nights, which, as you may know, is a frame tale with different stories tucked in between. 
Um, and it was written by many women over many millennia and over many continents. Um, so as an example, I will share with you Biblia Bandido. It should be noted that the project, I went there for 10 days initially, we came up with this character, and then I left and the project continued by this group of kids and their mommies and daddies. And, um, you know, I, I feel very, I'm so, it's to me it's so exciting, so thrilling that they carried it on um, such that his fame rivaled Santa Claus. And I think the success of how the project was adapted is um, due to this concept of white labeling in which you're making it your own. Um, in the North, there are ongoing Biblo Bandito happenings, uh, like this exhibition, which was in Central Harlem, the Sugar Hill Museum of Art and Storytelling, where there's 30% uh, of the middle school youth face literacy challenges. And, um, the Seattle Public Library, who facilitates Biblu Bandito themed paper circuitry and story crafting trainings to 60 librarians each year. Um, their, I mean, the question on how, for they, how, how they adapted it was, what does 21st century literacy mean? Um, so I also wanna say that I, contrary to what people think, I never play Biblu Bandido. Um, the point being that I wanna make sure that other people feel enfranchised to carry on the legend themselves. And in the <laughs> exhibition, with the um, people who are in the museum, um, I, I, I interface with the, the docents or the people, the museum attendants, um, with the purpose that they are the storytellers and they're carrying, carrying on the legend themselves. Um, so um, I feel it's the spread of the, I mean, you know, there's this ongoing question of how you define success in your work as an artist. Um, and um, for me, I feel like it's the adaptation that is that kind of signal. Um, 
in a different pro this is a different project, and uh, in the New Deal era, 1930s and 40s, for, uh, FDR um, passed some of the nation's most progressive legislation, which excluded domestic workers and farm workers from receiving those same rights because the fear was that if they gained um, economic power, that would translate to political power. Um, in the early 2000s, domestic workers, nannies, housekeepers, and caregivers in New York started sharing their stories with lawmakers and passed the nation's first domestic workers bill of rights, which granted them basic rights as other workers. Um, so an advocacy group in New York reached out to Studio Rev and asked us how to um, reach and inform the, the state's 200,000 domestic workers about the changing laws. And um, we did these series of co-design sessions where we created this audio novella app where you call in and you hear about your rights. Um, and this was before smartphones were available, so it was an audio, phone, audio interface. And when um, the, the movement started growing, moving across the nation now to eight states um, and other localities as well, then um, my team and I, as well as my then newborn son, we created this, uh, you know, the question was like, how do we get around to all these places? And domestic workers are, you know, a constituency that's quite working in isolation. How do we meet them where they're at? So we created the nanny van, which is, you know, us, a group of media makers and artists and advocates, and my son. And we traveled across the country, um, you know, and we would, um, the kinds of places that we would stop include things like parks or markets or worker centers or transit stops, and we kind of unpack and we share resources and so forth, and we're creating a number of tools along the way. Sorry, that went, went quite quickly. But, so there was, we created digital prints, um, uh, different, I'll get to that in a second. Um, I also spend a lot of time looking at the laws, both federal and state, and coming up with these policy toolkits, because if you read the law, it's entirely incomprehensible. Um, and, and the advocates, their primary purpose, they, I mean, they might not be thinking about how best to communicate the law or in a fun way that doesn't feel intimidating. So we make these kind of policy toolkits and what look like work like posters. And we also created these um, series of um, records because I was interviewing and recording um, women, um, and I especially love the women who are using singing in the movement and um, uh, who are incorporating joy and, 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 um, and dance parties. So I collaborated also with caregivers and choreographers, and we created a series of songs and discos that narrate the movement and the history. Um, so you're, it's kind of mnemonically encoding the information. And for me, I look to, um, my um, mother was a Berlitz Spanish teacher, and so, um, this is my brother over here, so when she was um, you know, doing homework with us, she would in incorporate these strategies of coming up with these wacky stories so we could remember certain words or whatever. And so this is what's in the background as we're creating these, um, these different bits, and especially also the care forces. If you're, if you're dancing and choreographing, you're kind of mnemonically in, in bodily encoding this information in a way that's um, memorable um, and, and relevant. Um, using the, you know, so 1930s and 40s, this moment of um, WPA era exclusion, I was using those posters, um, that iconography, and uh, creating these series of silkscreen posters which were really my way of dealing with policy that irritated me that I thought should be changed. Um, and um, I want to go back to this slide for a second, which was, um, so it's somehow it's doing this weird, it's not liking that slide, but essentially that what you saw for a second, um, Oh, it sticks. Okay. So here what I was doing was looking at the different, con you know, this question of technology for whom and by whom. Here we are thinking about the different constituencies. So in a lot of the work with the nanny van, um, we were making mostly worker-facing tools. So um, it's using, which uses a different kind of language and strategy and is accessed in a different play place. And if you're 
trying to reach domestic employers, so the people who employ domestic workers, right? So, for example, um, the legal toolkits are worker-facing, um, but stuff like the documentary that I'll show you um, a teaser of was produced really for domestic employers um, watching PBS, which is the nation's widely accessible um, channel because there's no fee for, you know, there's no barrier to entry and it's free. Um, so let me go to that. Help, help, stop. My name is Marissa John, and this 1967 Mercury Station Wagon is the Care Force One, inspired by some of the incredible caregivers I've met. So, Anjo, Choco, and I are going on an adventure from New York City to Miami. There is one problem we love the lights on. Care in America is undervalued. People don't see us with a brain. They see us as just people who clean or wipe old people's spot. But we are more than that. How was your day? They're often facing a larger degree of vulnerability because their immigration status is tied to their employer. At the turn of the last century, 90% of African American women were in domestic work. So there's a whole lot of changes that have to be done. I hope you'll join us as we navigate car issues and care issues and find solutions to both from the amazing people we meet along the way. So um, pa pause there for a second and raise your hand if you identify as uh, an artist. Um, awesome. So. There is this question of um, how, well, the question of how do you find success and who you're speaking to. I was doing these grad crits earlier today and we were talking about that in a few of the, the sessions. Um, you know, and I, I felt like for me, this question of how you define your practice and how you define success and just self-evaluation, are you doing what you want to be doing, um, was really informed by my, I worked for, um, a decade working as a community organizer and an advocate. And the, um, those n consider that the number of people involved in the art world is this many. And then, but you can also, I, I mean, I guess for me, the way that I define success is if I have relevance within this context, but also am reaching or able to reach a broader sector. Um, and um, so, having this kind of double ontological function or mandate to the work that I do where it's signifying and relevant in one sphere as well as in another. Um, and, um, you know, I mean, the project received media coverage and we presented it in a variety of different contexts, which is one metric of su su success, perhaps. Um, we did this these Twitter chats. Um, you see that we're trending just below um, Janice and um, the World Cup um, is around there. Um, but internally for us as an organization, we this, this slide, this is an image that we found on Facebook that we were not tagged in. And it was a year after we were here in California with the nanny van for the celebration for the California Coalition of Domestic Workers. And the Danny Van was there, and we had a Care Force disco, and we all had a lot of fun. And um, I felt so honored that they were so excited. Um, they were they were celebrating the anniversary of the California Domestic Worker Bill of Rights, and they thought that the funnest thing to do to commemorate it and like to have a cake and make a pinata was a nanny van. Um, so we felt like this was a metric of success. Also, like the Bilbo Bandito, we weren't involved with it. Like they just felt they felt enfranchised. Um, so that we love that example. Um, this is an organization um, that I've been collaborating with for a few years. Um, PVI is based in Uganda. And according to their media scan, the most popular, so they're a human rights and media advocacy organization. And according to their media scan, more than the most popular form of 
entertainment, more than TV and newspaper combined, is bootleg DVDs from Hollywood, Nollywood, and Bollywood. Um, so you go into these communal viewing, you pay a few cents, you go into the video hall, and um, you watch two or three screens at the same time, and the megaphone broadcasts what's going on to the outside community, entreating them to enter. So um, problematically, these films perpetuate conservative stereotypes about gender and sexuality in a region that has passed homophobic laws. Um, David Cecil is a friend of ours who was thrown in jail for putting on a, quote, gay play. Um, and so in a region where censorship runs high, what media and human rights advocates believe is important are, are alternative perspectives and the arts play a critical role in exercising freedom of speech. So that's the project, this is the project that I created with PVI. clear that <clears throat> our videos didn't replace the bootlegs. They were played as previews to the main film. So before you see Terminator 2, you see one of the videos by the artist that we I had curated into the show. <clears throat> so Video Sync Uganda functions as a parasite that intervents a circulatory system in order to profit, placing itself like a demon at key points of delegation. Jimena Canales and Marcus Krajewski note that the word demon first appears in the Iliad, but does not have a pejorative or negative context, uh, valence to it. Uh, demons simply mediated between humans and another realm. They were beyond human comprehension. Later in the 1950s, the term demon became a useful way for cybernetics and systems thinkers, such as Claude Shannon and Norbert Wiener, to explain exceptions to the second law of thermodynamics. The, the term demon became a useful term to account for things inexplicable that exceed the system. Canales and Kriuski write that demons came galloping back when they're exercised. Exegesis or interpretation, on the other hand, mitigates their power by helping us understand them. And I find this a useful term for thinking about how artwork can explore that which exceeds. And it's one of the pedagogical frameworks that I use in a course that I've taught at MIT for several years. Um, so I'm just thinking about demons. I'm next going to share this um, uh, this project that I created with my collaborators in Uganda. 
um, which is a series of bootleg-ready videos and photographs that explore how we see ourselves reflected and distorted in the other. After creating the video, I continued these works with collaborators in other regions where freedom of speech is censored and human rights are suppressed. They visualize the objection and aspirations of the subaltern. Emblematic of my work as a whole, they, question, they raise questions about the legal and historic forces that sanction some subjects and render others invisible. So. Um, I'm gonna leave you with this quote while um, I transition to this next video. Hold on just a second. We good? So you're thinking about masks and li the liberatory function of masks, okay? 
One day, as I was filing some paperwork, I came across my medical record. Inside was information about my copper IUD, and I started wondering about this piece of technology that's in my very own Snatch. So I began researching who invented the copper IUD, its history, its use, how many people have IUDs, and where did the copper in my Snatch come from? I needed to know what's at stake. One day, as I was filing some paperwork, I... Hello. <laughs> I'm Aphrodite, goddess of love and copper, which is why we share the same alchemical symbol, perhaps suggesting a relationship of fecundity. I am everywhere, but in the West, people like to say that I come from the island of Cyprus, where I existed in abundance, and mined starting in 8700 BCE, diffusing throughout Europe. When I'm exhausted by journeys like that, I retreat, I retreat into my Snatural Chapel, which was inspired by Byzantine fertility chapels. Made from copper fabric, my chapel blocks out cell phone signals and electrical wavelengths, an IUD as an IUD blocks sperm to create a controlled interior space of intimacy. You might recognize our alchemical symbol from the women's liberation movement starting in the 1970s, but originally in antiquity, the symbol was meant to resemble a hand mirror, which back then would have been made from polished copper or bronze. Many assume that as the goddess of love, the mirror symbolizes vanity, but others know that a mirror's ability to reflect also symbolizes a revelatory power and inner secret. So here is mine, I am up in you. Your body needs me. I already course your veins, and for some of you, I regulate your heart. I might even be in your snatch, enabling libidinal pleasure, as I have been since at least 400 BCE, evidence in this copper-based intrauterine contraceptive. I certainly enable your digital desire and networked digital selves whose ontic exhaust, to use Mark Jarzenbeck's term, I store and scatter throughout the world, spreading you wide. And while you need and desire me above five milligrams a day, I weaken you. If you are someone who has been overexposed to me, likely you're someone who carves me from the earth, handles and refines me, or someone who lives with and around the byproduct of my harvest or tailings. Over time and through your labor, I will affect your breath, skin, and mental functioning. What seems most sovereign, your own body, becomes violated by another who profits from your labor and your energetic output. When the abundance of your body confers this abundance to another, what seems most intimately yours and now mine has become no longer. I aggregate in the water, and in my harvest, I release other toxins leaching into the water for decades after I'm polluting 40% of America's waterways, says the EPA, such as in the case of the Yankee Doodle tailings pond, whose water has the same acidity as your stomach. 
Montana Resources is taking steps to keep waterfowl out of the Berkeley pit in Butte. They say they don't want to see more birds killed by the toxic water like they did two years ago. MTN's John Amy takes us to the pit to show us how drone technology is being used to keep birds away. By air and water. Officials are using any means to avoid what happened at the Berkeley pit in November of 2016 when more than 10,000 migrating snow geese landed in the toxic water, leaving thousands to die. Montana Resources hired an operator to fly this drone to haze the birds out of the pit. We've made some significant modifications to it for uh, hazing of waterfowl at the Berkeley Pit. Uh, for instance, we've added extra radio antennas to it. We've added uh, flashing strobe lights with a visibility of three nautical miles and uh, loud audible piezoelectric sirens um, that produce a ear piercing sound that the birds find uncomfortable. MR also hired a contractor with the Atlantic Richfield Company who built this remote controlled boat that can quickly get the waterfowl out of the pit. So how did we get to this Yankee Doodle travesty? As Al uh, historian Alan Greer conveys, the problem starts after the American Revolution when the U.S. has won but has empty coffers. So besides being cash poor, they're trying to make sure the Brits and the French stay away. So invoking the spirit of manifest destiny, the government adapts Spain's pillage and plunder mining laws and says to Americans, well, listen, all you all go out there, pioneer the West, and whatever you find you can keep, just give us a little when you do make a profit. This gets codified in the mining law of 1872, which even states that if there are people already living there, including Native Americans, your discovery of valuable minerals overrides their sovereign territorial claim. Mining laws haven't really changed for the past 150 years, although the mining industry itself has changed quite a lot. I mean, listen, these days I'm not just lying around on the crust of the earth and easy to mine. People have been exhausting my abundance since 8700 BCE. Today I recede deep within the earth and to possess me you have to excavate volumes and volumes of ore to yield the same amount, which creates more and more tailings. I am being overused. In a recent victory led by the Center for Biological Diversity, the judge invalidated Rosemont's mi Rosemont Mines' attempt to emplace a copper mine in southern Arizona's Santa Rita Mountains on the grounds that just piling up 1.9 billion tons of its own toxic tailings indicated that the land underneath was not really valuable. The eco-justice advocates from Earthworks and lawmakers have put forward the Mining, Leasing, and Reclamation Act, whose key provisions aim to protect treasured places, improve environmental standards, perfect provide a fair financial return to taxpayers, bolster inspections and enforcement, and create an abandoned mine fund to clean the 500,000 abandoned mines that will require an estimated $50 billion. These mining laws are based in part on a set of principles advocating for free, prior, and informed consent, which are transferable to other domains. And this is the question about mines and others that I'm exploring in the workshop that I'm co-teaching with architect Rafi Siegel um, as my mortal self. And I'm interested in this question about self power, self-determination, and consent, both territorial and bodily. So turning back for a second to coochies and control, contraceptive ad advocates like Margaret Sanger saw the IUD as a tool to liberate women and encourage pleasure. But by the 1960s and 70s, corporations, population control advocates, and NGOs positioned the IUD as an essential sterilization device that can control America's low-income indigenous and immigrant communities and solve the population bomb of the global south. Millions of women were given the IUD without their consent or economically incentivized to accept the IUD. But many of these women, especially in patriarchal societies where they felt it wasn't safe to openly challenge their husbands, saw the IUD as an invisible long-term contraception device that gave them the ability to control their bodies and lives. Problematically, one of the IUDs used by 2.5 million women was a plastic Dalcon shield released on the market in 1971 without ad adequate testing. 
The device's multi-filament string carried bacteria from the gyna into the uterus, which led to an increased likelihood of infections, septic abortions, and infertility. 18, William, 18 women died, 200,000 reported serious injuries. And after 12,000 lawsuits and mass uproar, the Delcon Shield was finally pulled off the market in the 1980s and the pharmaceutical company went bankrupt. Since that time, scientific advances have improved the safety of the IUD, and in the early 2000s, after memories of the Delcon Shield faded, the copper IUD was reintroduced to moms in the global north like me as a means of family planning. Quote, Today, we've seen a rise in demand for IUDs, which would outlast Trump's presidency. So, while, and while anti-choice conservatives attempt to rewrite science, uh, attempt to rewrite science, and scientists push back, advocacy groups around the world are doubling down on campaigns that affirm the right to choose. But as women of color led movements have been reminding us in the 1970s, the focus on choice should be widened to one about access. And again, this question about technological access and reproductive technology. The freedom to have children, the freedom to not have children, and access and the access to reproductive choices and pleasure as a pillar of well-being and women's and of women's pleasure. Because reproductive tech makes loving feel good. A sentiment that I, Aphrodite, believe that should be monumentalized as a public art sculpture. I want to make visible this thing that's normally physically and discursively invisible. Klaus Oldenburg makes these large scale pop art sculptures of quotidian American objects. But rather than enlarge an innocuous object like as Oldenburg does in his public sculptures of pies, ice cream cones, or household objects, what I'm calling Zap would commemorate a historically complex object instantly recognizable to millions of women who become interlocutors of the project. It places their stories, desire, and hard-won victories for reproductive choice at the center. Soaring into the sky like a secular feminist version of Rio's Christ the Redeemer, Zap boldly responds to today's political climate by commemorating these <laughs> self-determination self scientific truth in women's desire. So I want to let you know that I'm looking for a site to build this sculpture on. And I know you will know someone or some organization that needs a zap on this site. And so I thought I would tell you your talking point when you're talking to this potential recipient. So um, zap, which would be made out of bronze, a copper alloy, is conductive. So it functions like an axis mundi or a, uh, a center of the earth and a lightning rod. It so when we think about lightning rods, speaking of technology, we think of them as passively receiving um, electrons from the sky. But in fact, what's happening is they're always actively building these ladders of electrons to the sky. And then when you reach it, when the, you know, it's the right atmospheric conditions, it um, releases uh, the electrons through one of these small ladders. So you see, ZAP then is commingling between the sky and the earth in the name of love and copper and self-determination. Um, and and I, I will end there. <laughs> I'm happy to take your questions. There is someone um, roving with a mic. Let's see. Um, you? Uh, well, okay, let's do you first, Ev. Would you mind passing this down, please? Hi. Hi. Um, I love how your work is didactic and helpful, and you think of social consciousness. And what what is what do you think is the role of artists, young artists, now during this political climate? Oh. Um, Okay, what is the role of artists today in this political climate or young artists today? Um, I think that's a complex and interesting question because I think sometimes through, really sometimes through the making of the work, you're surfacing questions that you didn't know were the right questions, or you're finding the right question. Um, I think sometimes it is um, the ability to speak to different audiences or speak to the unconverted. Sometimes it's, um, 
a way to force political pressure. Sometimes it's, um, I mean, I also am a firm believer that art is sometimes provides a important retreat. I mean, um, I, uh, was I was talking with a student earlier today and I was saying, some people tend to assume that I uh, don't like going to museums or don't like, um, I mean, I really love me a James Terrell and like decorative wallpaper or I, I mean, I really like seeing stuff. And I feel like sometimes when things are so, when it feels like too much, there's nothing more relaxing or energizing to me than seeing artwork. Um, and really just like the whole range of what people are doing, I think is always fascinating. So I, I think it's a really important part of political and well, like human expression altogether. Um, and I think it's always a helpful reflex to think about what is the function of this particular work. And it might just be for you, it might just be meditative, but it might be have this other component in which case it's worth exploring larger hard questions and figuring out how to do that. Hi, Marissa, thank you for the talk. Um, I was just a bit curious about your proposal for the sculpture that was similar to Christ the Redeemer. Yeah. So um, I was very intrigued by the statistics that you gave on the effects of copper mining, but I wasn't sure whether your sculpture would have copper in it. Um, that's a really good question. Um, so it would be, in my fantasy, the sculpture would be made out of copper. Okay. Um, I mean, I think, so when we, the amount of copper that goes into an IUD and then by comparably into like the amount of copper that goes into sculptures is really negligible mm -hmm. um, because the greatest, it's like building an industry and urban expansion that's the greatest consumer of copper. Um, it's, it's not like artwork or sculptures or the IUD, there's uh, one penny would yield 10 IUDs. So mm -hmm. um, yeah, is that what you meant? Yeah, I guess I was just wondering um, yeah. about the paradox in itself. But yeah. Thank you. Hi. <clears throat> Great presentation. Where can I get a copy of all the incredible music in your presentation? Oh, oh. Um, well, some of it, it can be found on um, SoundCloud, because sometimes I'm commissioning people to produce um, music. Um, so that, like the video in Uganda, those are a lot of um, East African. Actually, there's East African and then some, um, some from West Africa as well, but it's this music label that's in, in, um, in Uganda. Um, so I guess if you email me, I can send you links. Great, where can I get you? Oh, there it is. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Hello. Hi. Um, in your art, what do you consider to be the relative function of art that's representational or at least referent, like Zap, mm. versus art that's fictive, like a uh, Biblio Bandito in like a political function? Oh, um, so when is, is the question like this, when is something about something and, and representing, or, uh, when is something a referent of something else and when is it a dynamic thing that's doing? Is that what you mean? More so like if, if your art has a political aim Mm -hmm. How do you consider um, the relative functions of like fiction versus nonfiction in the way that you choose to produce it? Okay, fiction versus nonfiction. Um, well, I feel like sometimes fiction is a shortcut for um, for unearthing things that perhaps cannot be said or have not yet been said. I mean, with Biblu Bandido, the I mean, I guess I'm always thinking about this question of how to make something sticky. And oftentimes it's something that's highly imaginative. And I'm not saying, because I'm highly, I'm saying like, I work with so many people and we're, we are striving to make something that captures the imagination that then would be sticky. Um, so, or with the video sync, uh, the mirror mask videos, that project, a lot of it was like in the making where kind of, my collaborators in Uganda were coming to terms with how do we even put this into words and it kind of exceeds words and really the image or sound or the kind of feeling is what um, 
conveys a zeitgeist or a sentiment or political sentiment. Um, but that, that's a good question. Okay, thank you. Um, I was wondering, since I see that you've gone to like MIT and Berkeley, um, and I have not gone to MIT or Berkeley, and I'm actually getting an education at art school. Um, I was wondering how this, uh, such like notable um, universities affect your work, because I, I, I'm really interested in the same type of work you're using, using art uh, to affect communities all over the world, and how I can still be respected as an artist if I'm not getting education that's at that sort of uh, notable level. I don't think that you're, um, I mean, I think as a, a, a maker, like the only thing that you have, like the, the most important thing is the caliber of your work and the integrity of your work. And I think that you, that is independent of an institution. So, I, and, I, and the inverse of that question is also relevant, I think, if you are in a place of institutional privilege, whatever that might be, because it may not be necessarily university, and you're working, I guess, I'm, let me just take a step back, because I don't mean to tell you what to do or like, but when I'm working with an institution and I'm working with, you know, I'm almost always working with different community groups, what I try and do is I come with the assumption First of all, I ask a community group, like, is this institutional affiliation even relevant for you? Is this something that you need in the work that you do? Um, so as an example, I had this project that took place at the, um, oh, we were doing a disco at the um, Perez Art Museum, which is a well-known institution in, in Miami Art Museum. And um, I was working with a group of domestic workers, and I was like, I mean, I totally understand. Groups on the ground have a lot of stuff to do, and they can, they're frequently over capacity. So I completely respect having been on that side as well. Like I don't have time to work with or the capacity at this moment to collaborate. Um, so I always ask. Um, and in this woman's case in Miami, she said, "Well, actually, we're trying to pass a citywide bill of rights, and we need allies through that through institutions like this museum. So for her, it's a use. It's useful to have me leverage that." institutional power, um, and I try when I'm bridge, playing this bridging function to leave having introduced these folks, and now they're, they're in they're, they work with each other still, so that feels good to me. Um, yeah. Did that adequately answer your question? While it's passing over, I want to point out my friend Doug Parker over here, who is a collaborator in the sense that he's one of the people who is introducing me to different people in the mining sector. Um, so he is an advocate for worker safety, and before was at the Mine Safety Health Ad Administration, and, um, and uh, an example of a wonderful collaborator. Um, yeah. Hi, Hi. Um, thank you for the talk. So I'm curious as to how your experience as an organizer uh, for 10 years prior to becoming, I guess, openly an artist has informed your practice and what did your art practice look like at the time when you were identified more as an organizer? Oh, um, you know, I should say that, I mean, I worked for 10 years working as a community organizer um, and, and really before that, I worked in the construction industry for, um, with my, one of my long-term collaborators and we ran his construction company. And that's really like when I finished Berkeley, that's what I did for, that's how we made our money. Um, and I was working as a school teacher as well. So, um, I mean, I, I guess um, I've identified, I mean, I strongly identified identify as someone with a K through 12. I mean, I've taught, taught, taught so many small people, and I teach teachers 
at Teachers College at Columbia still, which is just like teacher training. Um, I very much was informed. I mean, my interest in worker issues and labor comes from working in that field. Um, and my, um, I, as a community organizer, yeah, and I mean, I guess it's like I'm perhaps like many of you identify as someone who's artist and da 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 da. I should also point out that in um, on the West Coast, people are more transparent about I am an artist and a carpenter. I am an artist and something else, um, which I think is important to not obfuscate where you get your money from because if you are uh, like on the East Coast where I live now, people just say I'm an artist, I'm a performer, whatever. But they might be a dog walker, they might be like a nanny, whatever, and people think it's degrading to talk about that. But then if you don't have the open conversation, then you can't do the work of figuring out like, oh, well, how you don't get down to the nitty gritty and then it promotes inequity. And it's particularly for women and people of color. So um, I think it's really helpful to be transparent and talk about all the things that inform your practice. And it's like a whole person strategy. Hi, thanks for your talk. Um, I'm wondering about the, um, if you find much difference between the types of resistance and support you get depending on the subject matter of your project, like moving from literacy to domestic workers' rights to like reproductive rights, and if you find that it's harder or easier to get support or you see like active resistance um, for some um, of those. So is the question about well, is, is part of the question, how do you fund your work? And then like, does how does it change from project to project? Sorry, yeah, I wasn't um, totally specific. I guess I'm, I mean, I'm curious about funding, but I'm also um, interested in sort of more like community or popular support oh. um, in terms of like how easy is it um, or difficult to gain momentum around okay. a project? Um, well, I th that's a good question. I think with, so as an example in this recent work, around um, this natural history. Um, I mean, I spent, I guess I've spent two years researching the subject matter. And part of researching and figuring out what you need to research is learning who's doing what and building those relationships. And um, I mean, so it, it feels like a young project for me. My relationship with the National Domestic Workers Alliance is nine, we've been working together for nine years. And my relationship with this community in Honduras, I mean, that was like 10 years ago. And we have, you know, we're, we still kind of keep in contact, but not really on a day to day level. So, um, so um, I guess I'm a believer in building up slow relationships. Um, and in the way that it's like slow dating, so you might develop a relationship with the group by doing a small piece. And sometimes I know that young people think like, oh my God, I'm not gonna design a flyer. They think that artists, is, like all they do is design flyers. But like if you have those chops, which I like do graphic design, it's really, it does take me like two hours. So I'm happy to do that. And it starts a conversation and building trust. It's kind of like you're, you're meeting a friend, like you don't automatically marry, you know, marry someone who you're, it's advisable. Um, you kind of, you go to coffee with them first kind of thing. Um, so I think within those relationships, it's like trust building. And then for the outer, I think part of the outer momentum to your, more directly to your question, also relies on the integrity of this relationship um, and the maintain, main, maintenance and the relationship holding. Hi, I'm curious if you could talk a little bit more about your relationship with the copper industry and in building relationships with collaborators or other people you work with, and you're working with, with something like a mining industry or another kind of infrastructure industry. How do you, um, I'm curious how, how they see kind of the value proposition of working with you. Whenever you're trying to build a relationship with someone, they kind of want to know what's in it for them, right? Yeah. And, I'm, and I'm curious how you think about that, and specifically in the context of these kinds of collaborators. 
Yeah, I mean, I will say that um, I'm in conversation with a copper mining company. And um, so I really am interested in hearing from them. Um, I mean, we've been in conversation, and I think for, so, okay, let me back up and say that for the National Domestic Workers Alliance, I think, and when we are reaching out to domestic employers, what I don't want to do is, there's no easy solution. There's a number of solutions that can be made, and I'm not interested in pointing fingers and um, making someone feel bad or ashamed. I, don't, I think it's hugely malproductive. Um, like, I want people to feel energized, like a dance party style. <laughs> um, no, but uh, to be not um, disingenuous, like, I do want people to feel a sense of agency. So I'm interested and I engage with domestic employers like myself, and I come with the assumption that no one wants to be crappy. People want to make change, but oftentimes it's hard to figure out what to do. So if you can point people to solutions, then you are changing things. So with mining, I feel like we, what does it mean to engage a mine who's intending to do well and who compare, who has a lot of political leverage to make changes so that the, the mines who have less resources see them as a role model and can implement those. Um, so, I think for, I was on the phone this week with a mining, the mining um, group called um, Resolve, and they're coming up with the FPIC, the Free um, and Prior Informed Consent um, kind of like uh, platform or principles. And she said, like, look, I get calls all the time from journalists or historians, you know, academics and so forth. And the reason why I, re I called you back was because you said, in your email and on your, on, I followed up with a voicemail a couple of times. Um, you know, I said, I'm, I work as an artist. I work, I mean, I work half of my life as like an advocate and half of it as an artist. And I'm interested in um, uh, bringing urban people closer to the sites of extraction and, and being solutions oriented. So for her, she felt like it. I, I wasn't just another journalist covering it, I was bringing, uh, my value added was working as an artist or, and working in the media. Hi, um, I noticed that with, uh, I guess, most of the projects that you shared, except maybe the, no, actually the copper one as well, each of them were accompanied by a video that um, was almost like part um, film trailer, part promotional video, part music video that kind of summarized or encapsulated the project in some way. And I was curious because each of the projects seemed really different with very different communities, very different processes, and um, in many ways dealing with like very serious issues of illiteracy or you know, sexual violence, but then all of those videos were in a very similar like aesthetic and style, and I was just curious um, how you approach those and what your thinking was and um, how you see them functioning. Um, yeah, so, I mean, there's certainly longer videos. The full PBS documentary is, the tempo is really different. Um, it's, so it's 20 minutes broken up into four episodes, so each one's about five minutes long. Um, and it's, um, there's moments that are funny and there's moments that will make people cry. Um, and there's, um, I mean, and, and like the care, there's one video, I mean, all of the video, the work is online if you go to my website. Um, there's one video called Care Force Disco and it's, it's really about, I mean, it's, like very heartbreaking stories. And um, it's, it's, I mean, I'm intending to both make it not, like make, I, I want someone to feel, when you're watching it, my intended goal is to make someone feel something in a different way, um, but also to not devastate them. Um, and I think I work with advocates who trust that I um, can do that and they find it useful for them to be able to show people. So because there's other documents out there about care, 
um, I feel like the value added that I can bring is to make something aesthetically, or at least I strive to make something aesthetically rewarding and have an element of playfulness or humor. Um, but I mean, there's definitely a lot of, I mean, like if you were to go to Honduras and see the, the, the situation there is, it's pretty grave. Um, but I, I, I think it's important to portray, and if, if my goal is to portray people with dignity um, and joy, and joy and levity and humor are strategies for dignifying someone, then um, I, I guess those are what I see as my key tools. Um, but there's, I mean, there's definitely stuff that's like heartbreaking. On that note. Um, actually, I, I was told that we could ask one more question. And so I'm gonna, <laughs> instead of doing like closing thank you, which I'll do too, I'll maybe ask one more question that's sort of on the theme of what's like and unlike, um, what in your work are like and unlike each other. And I wonder if this new project is kind of a d departure from other types of practices that you've been involved in or not. Maybe just as a closing reflection, what feels continuous about this, this, this next project? What feels like, yeah, this is what I've always been thinking about, always been doing, and what feels different to you about this, this new project? Um, that's a really good question. Um, I think what feels, so one thing that's exciting to me that feels new is that in a lot of my work, I haven't, so like in undergrad here, I studied both art and interdisciplinary studies, which is make your own major kind of thing, and I focus on cultural geography, and I was looking at the shaping of Mission Bay. Um, you know, there's like ballparks there, but it was like really quite a, I mean, it has a fascinating history to it. And so I, um, to me, the mining is a continuation of that strategy of looking at how people see land, how people are shaped by landscapes and how people shape, how are shaped by and shape landscapes. Um, and I think it's a continuation also of my interest in kind of labor issues and, um, and a women's per feminist perspective. I think what feels, what, if, what feels different about it? Um, I mean, I think this project will, I tend to create, again, these frame tales and there's different bits that come along the way. So you guys are getting the early version in which I'm like, how do I talk about the mining law of 1872? I'm like, oh, I know, if I dress up as Aph Aphrodite. <laughs> <laughs> so you can tell me whether it worked or not. <laughs> um, so um, what feels different about it? Um, I, I mean, maybe I'm going more and more bonkers or being more hallucinogenic. I don't know. Um, is this on? Oh. Uh, I guess on the hallucinogenic <laughs> note, um, <laughs> I think we should end here. Thank you, everybody, for coming. And thank you, Marisa, so much and for the space and the organization. Thank you so much.